So if you are new to Textile Talks, we welcome you. And uh, this is a free series of weekly presentations and panel discussions from fiber art organizations that include the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilt and Textiles, Studio Art, Associate, art Quilt Associates, Surface Design Association, and us at the Modern Quilt Guild. And if you hear a toddler in the background, I'm so sorry. My toddler's homesick. <laughs> so hopefully it won't be too distracting. Uh, we also want to thank our, our Textile Talk sponsors, who are Moda, Fabrics and Supplies, Quilting Daily, eQuilter.com, Orifil, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spool Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, TheQuiltShow.com, and Thai Silks. So now that we have all the housekeeping out of the way, I am thrilled to introduce you to Marsha McDowell and Felicity Kahn. So first, a little bit about Marsha. She is a professor and curator of folk arts and quilt studies at Michigan State University Museum and is the director of the Quilt Index. She has authored numerous publications on quilt history. And we are also very excited to be joined by Felicity Kahn all the way from South Africa. Um, so we hope her internet will stay great for this presentation. Um, she may go off of video if she has any issues, so. Sorry about that in the background. Um, <laughs> so Felicity comes from a line of creative women who were all involved in working with fabric. A retired banking administrator, she took up quilting when she became a mother. Now also a quilt teacher who promotes equality, justice, and peace, Khan has exhibited with South Africa and coordinated, coordinated quilting outreach groups for women in under-resourced and underserved communities. So with that, I will mute myself so you cannot hear my screaming toddler, and I will pop back on at the end for Q&A. So with that, I will go ahead and hand things over to Marsha. Okay, thank you, Brenna. So I am going to immediately share um, my first slide of the PowerPoint. So give me a second while I do that. And I have to say that as I'm looking at um, some of the comments of, uh, or the notations of people signing in, I'm just thrilled. I'm seeing so many people from South Africa, including some friends. So hey, back to you all. It's very fun. So, okay, so here's our title slide. And then here's our plan for today. I'm going to give a brief history of quilt history in South Africa. And then I am going to interview, but actually it's more like a conversation between Felicity and myself. And she's going to talk about her life in quilting and also about some of her quilts. And I'll be including some of her images in my PowerPoint. Um, and then as part of this, I also am going to introduce you to the Quilt Index uh, to view quilts from South African museums and those that were documented in the South African Quilt History Project. So let me get started. Um, you wonder why I, a, a woman from uh, the middle of Michigan in the U.S., is doing work um, or is talking about quilt history in South Africa. So, well, here's my here's my reason. Um, in 1997, and I'm going to be reading some notes here. In 1997, I was invited to with my husband, my research partner, to conduct a needs assessment and a strategic plan for the museums at University of Fort Hare, which is located in, uh, it's a historically disadvantaged university in the Eastern Cape province. Actually, it's in the town of Alice. Um, during that first two week trip to South Africa, I just immediately had my antenna up for quilts. And sure enough, I was finding them even in the town of, of Alice. So since that 1997 first trip to today, I have um, visited nearly 25 museums in South Africa, which have quilt collections. I've met artists, I've met curators, historians of the country, historians of textiles, 
and um, and many cultural heritage workers. And I have just been privy to the generosity of so many individuals who have made then what has been a sustained research project um, possible. And along the way, I met Felicity, which is why she is joining us today. So um, yeah, here's just a couple of pictures, just to give you a sense of the back of the house of museums. Uh, that one was, I showed you was in Kimberley. This is in Durban. And, um, you know, they, they're just some extraordinary quilts that you will find in those museums. But um, that just gives you a taste. But now I'm going to talk about the history. So indigenous peoples in South Africa, the Koya and the San, uh, they have a long um, history of using piece together text or piece together hides for clothing and bed covers. And this was before extensive contact with non-indigenous peoples. So then though, with the contact with others, those colonial um, uh, people who came from, from Holland, from, from, the, from England, who came into South Africa and began to uh, use the resources of the land, um, there was contact between indigenous and with, um, with these settlers. And so eventually with that contact came knowledge of new techniques of construction and design, and eventually the availability of a large variety of materials, including beads and cloth that of origins within the African continent um, from the Far East and from Western Europe. Now, the earliest examples of, of the kind of textiles that today we call quilts appear to be especially affiliated with those individuals of Dutch, French, and British descent who immigrated to Southern Africa. And the Dutch began to visit and settle in South Africa as early as the 1600s. And um, as part of the establishment of Dutch trading routes, which of course carried textiles um, along with other goods. Um, and they, those Dutch were followed by groups of French and Huguenots who sought religious freedom and land to establish farms and vineyards. And then the discovery of diamonds and gold attracted thousands of British settlers and the country became under the rule of the British government. Um, and eventually was a member of the British Commonwealth until 1961. So quilting and quilted and patched textiles dating to as early as the first decade of the 19th century are held in all of these public and private collections. And um, they mirror the patterns of and materials of those that were being made by their places of origin, as well as then through their contact, what was happening in South Africa. So here's one quilt that is one of the earliest known extent quilts in South Africa. And this was made by a, a, a woman, an Irish woman named Sarah Pike, who gifted it apparently to her uncle, who was one of those um, Irish individuals who during the 1820s immigrated to first to Port Elizabeth, where they landed, and then went inland to work in the um, in the the mines. And the, the woman who owns it is a, a a direct descendant of Sarah Pike, and it's a a, a beautiful beautiful um, quilt. Now, along the way, as I met with all these individuals and museums, I also have been working as the director of the Quilt Index. And that's based at the uh, Michigan State University and um, headquartered at Matrix, the Digital Humanities Center um, on campus, which is a research hub. And I started talking with all of the curators and directors of the museums in an effort to try and get their 
stories and their images of their quilts into the quilt index. And so I'm not showing you a live presentation. This is just a uh, of, of the quilt index. This is just a screenshot of the first page of it. But here is a screenshot of just um, one page of many pages of quilts that are made in South Africa. I think we have about 15 uh, quilt collections in there now. Here's another page just to give you a flavor. And it's a marvelous resource. Um, and here's just one example that I wanted to uh, call out um, because this one is uh, one that is believed to be associated with a Vortrekker. Um, you know, those of you in South Africa, Felicity, of course, knows that that term, but it's a term uh, that was used to describe uh, it, a group of Dutch speaking individuals who migrated by, by wagon from the Cape, where Felicity is now living, um, to the inner parts of, of South Africa, because they were trying to escape the British rule. This is why I gave you a little bit of the history before I got started. And it was that little light orangey peachy color that seemed to be favored by Vortrekkers. And you still see it today in some of the bonnets that they recreate and wear at um, uh, different Afrikaner events. Now, I'm not showing you a live presentation of the Quilt Index because earlier this year, I did a textile talk with my colleague Beth Donaldson on how to use the Quilt Index. So that presentation, that textile talk presentation is, was also recorded and is archived and available through the YouTube site of Modern Quilt Guild and of SACWA. Now, you might have already um, been eagle-eyed and noticed that there were some bonnets among the quilts in the two previous slides. And yes, that is true, because we wanted to make sure that we included, per request of many of those curators and those collection managers, one element in their collections, a textile element in their collections that um, was actually embl emblematic of that Vortrekker period, of that pioneer period, and, and that is bonnets, or as they're called there, cappies. Um, Felicity can correct my pronunciation of that in, in a moment, <laughs> but um, then every one of those bonnets is is made with corded um, uh, quilting. And they're just stunning patterns. And some people have done some research and think that they're connected to uh, French quilting traditions, but um, no matter where they have come from, they are seen as a symbol of Afrikaner um, cultural heritage. And then I wanted to point out this. I have gone into the quilt index and done a search and a compare and contrast. Um, uh, use that feature, which you can learn if you look at the quilt index textile talk. Um, and I've just picked out some of the many quilts that are in those museum collections that are hexagon and mosaic. And I can say that when I went to the first museum and started looking at their collections, I thought, wow, isn't this amazing? I didn't expect so many historical quilts in South Africa would be hexagon and mosaic until it was like, oh my gosh, of course. That is the kind of, of pattern that was popular uh, during the, the same period of immigration of the, the big migration from uh, Britain of, of individuals. So of course they were bringing with them that textile uh, aesthetic, that construction aesthetic. And so, yes. And I sh should note 
these uh, collections of quilts are mostly of colonial, not, not indigenous, but of colonial material culture. And um, not, many, not many museums have collected contemporary quilts. But bringing us to contemporary quilts, I wanted to draw your attention to the South African Quilters Guild. It's, it's been uh, in existence, uh, let me just look at my notes, um, since, um, oh, I had this written. It, it's been in existence for <laughs> quite a few years because um, they are, I think, celebrating soon uh, in another anniversary. They have, and I, I'm encouraging you to go and take a look at their website. They spearheaded uh, the quilt documentation project, the history project, um, a number of years ago. And so their documentation records are like many of the other state, provincial, um, Canadian, provincial, American state documentation project records. Their records are in the quilt index combined with what the museums themselves have sent me. And then they also have, like we have in the U.S., a, a Hall of Fame. And so there's a page devoted to those who have been inducted to their Hall of Fame, and there's resources on other quilt guilds, the smaller quilt guilds, uh, and of uh, some galleries of the work of South African contemporary quilters. So it's a wonderful resource, and I encourage you to, to take a look at that. Now, this is just one gallery of one traveling exhibit that the South African quilt uh, group has put together. And I think if you take a look at this, you will see that, um, yes, you know, there is a rhinoceros or a, a, a buffalo. And, and then you see, wow, there's all kinds of, of um, uh, you know, landscapes that maybe you didn't think were the kind of landscapes that you would see in South Africa if you've never been there. But I think what happens in the quilts is that it shows the broad diversity of natural life and of the um, environment in South Africa. The national flower is a protea, so often you will see quilts made with a protea. Um, lions, you know, the big five lions and and um, elephants and all those are often featured, but also um, the kind of architecture that you see, uh, whether it's in the in the informal settlements in the townships or in um, you know the Afrikaner Dutch uh, um, uh, ar architecture in the, the Cape Town area, so in, or the Rondevals in the the Eastern Cape, so. These quilts that are being made in South Africa do indeed um, show maybe a color palette, uh, some environmental features, some natural features that you would not see in predominantly in other countries, including the U.S. Another group I wanted to draw your attention to in terms of contemporary quilting is Fiberworks. This is the organization that I think has done the most to promote um, art quilts. And uh, it has fiber artists in general, and not all of them make quilts, but those that do are always pushing the boundaries of what a quilt is. And again, great resources, great galleries that you can find in that um, site. And then so here's just a, a, a few images of quilts. Um, all, all of these are affiliated with projects that have been established by government agencies, by artists, activists, by quilt groups um, who are working to um, address uh, economic development, especially in the rural areas for those, uh, mostly for women. And by taking the skills that women already 
know, which was sewing. Um, we've got these activists who are working as mediators to try and help um, establish maybe quality control, marketing efforts, um, awareness of the quilts. And all three of these quilts are from such projects. Uh, this one here is actually from University of Fort Hare. There's a project situated right on the campus. Um, it does these uh, strikingly beautiful quilts. This one, uh, the larger one, which I think is a nice one to show like the intersection of a of African fab fabrics and non-African fabrics and um, imagery that's more African and imagery that is more traditional. Um, so that one is from a, a project uh, just outside of Durban. And then the one in the corner is from a, a group of women, the um, Zamani uh, quilting group. It's in, based in Soweto. And that one in the corner, just I'm just showing you a little tiny bit of it. You can see the whole thing in the quilt index. Um, it it uh, incorporates sheshwe cloth. And that leads me to my last slide in this speed overview of, of quilt history, and sheshwe cloth. I couldn't talk about South African quilting without mentioning sheshwe cloth. And you can see the how it's spelled down there at the bottom of the screen. It's a cloth that is produced by Dagama Textiles based in Prince William's town, um, just outside of that town in the Eastern Cape. And it's cloth that has been historically used by uh, to in, in garments worn by enslaved individuals, domestic workers, soldiers. And over time, it has become also um, an, an identity marker of being South African. So if you're in South Africa and you see somebody wearing uh, a garment or uh, holding a handbag made of, of uh, sheshwe cloth, you, you go, you know that they are feeling like they are part of being a South African. And today you can buy all kinds of, of fabrics that are used in now everyday clothing, clothing for special occasions, and it's even moved into high fashion. And some of the, the most um, innovative fashion designers in South Africa um, are using uh, sheshwe cloth, again, as a statement of being a South African. Many a quilt has incorporated sheshwe cloth, and that's not only in South Africa, but I have seen it as I've done studies of African American quilts in the US. I have also seen many quilters who have snippets of this African fabric incorporated into their work as well. Now, that was a speed overview. I am working on a book with lots of contributions from a number of South African colleagues. Uh, on this topic, and um, hopefully it will be forthcoming in a year. Um, but uh, that will at least give you some grounding before we turn now to the conversation with Felicity. So Felicity, if you can unmute your, okay, and I'm going, so let me just say that I, I had a wonderful, couple hour um, uh, interview with her um, at her home in her studio, which she can tell you about in a second. Um, maybe it was two years ago. It was pre-pandemic and right. it was a, just a delightful conversation. So I'm thrilled today that she can join us um, across time. <laughs> it's eight Ate something there in South Africa and um, and across you know the big water. So with that, uh, Felicity, I am going to pull up your first image, and I think that while you're you are going to talk about some of these images, but I will probably intersperse with some questions about how you got into quilting, etc. Okay. 
Thank you, Marsha. And uh, thanks for inviting me. And thanks for Brenna um, hosting this. It's um, quite exciting for me um, to be able to be on this program. Um, so, you know, you want me to talk about that quilt uh, immediately? Please tell us a little bit more. I mean, uh, in the introduction, Brenna did say that, you know, you got into quilting, you know, after, you know, in a certain point in your life. So why were you not involved in quilting before? Well, um, I was um, uh, in banking, you know, I, as, as in the introduction, um, uh, Brenna spoke about the fact that I came from a, 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 a family of women who were very involved in sewing. My paternal grandmother was a, a designer and seamstress of note uh, making bridal ensembles. And my mother and my maternal grandmother, they took up the other side and got me into the other side of crochet, knitting, and continuing to, to sew other little things when I was really small. I started at about five. So um, I've been around fabric for, for many, many years, and I really, really enjoy that. Um, I never, I when I think about it now, I think I should have actually made a career of that, but it never happened. And I took off um, uh, on a banking trajectory and um, I landed up always having a continued love of fabric and um, always had some fabric projects on the go. Um, I married a very ambitious chartered accountant and um, we lived and traveled the world. And this really enriched my knowledge um, and love of fabric further. I was always drawn to fabric um, in the countries we traveled to and the culture that evolved around that. Um, and when we were traveling, I always carried a small bag containing essentials for a project. And this kept me busy as the trailing spouse of this man that wanted to travel and work all over the world. Um, we had approximately 50 house moves in our lifetime together. So it was extremely necessary for me to have um, something to occupy myself in between moves and um, having a fabric project was very, very useful. When we lived in Australia, I did several sewing courses and I started, and that was when I really started to have an interest in quilting. Um, the, 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 the art of quilting in Australia is really, really big and craft is recognized um, widely. So it was easy to, to, to fall into um, working with, with fabric and um, looking at quilting and so on. When we got back to South Africa, I returned with an eight month old little boy in 93. Um, and this was just before the first free and fair elections. Um, that was after having been in Australia for about 12 years. Um, and when I returned, I sort of envisioned a future where I could be involved in quilting and um, continuing to be able to be um, a stay at home mom. Um, I did my work, first workshop here, um, and which was a sampler. And that's always been um, the start um, of learning the various techniques um, of quilting. Um, I joined the Good Oak Quilters Guild, which is our local provincial guild, the Umbrella umbrella body for the province. And after a good number of years as, as, as a member, they invited me to become the outreach liaison officer. I enjoyed this role very much because it was interacting with donors and um, the recipients and collecting, sorting and distributing donations. Um, people are very, very generous and the donors allowed us to supply most of the outreach groups with an enormous amount of um, uh, articles that, that they could use in, re, in, in, in the quilting. 
um, we did have a, a, a situation where within the quilting world, people are really fussy about the fabric they use. So everybody wants to only use 100% quilting cotton. But of course, your donations come, come in all types of fabric. And my belief is we have to try and teach people to work with every kind of fabric they can use. You know, um, when the origin of quilting was from poor people. And so any kind of uh, fabric is possible to be used. It's of course still nice to use the pretty stuff, but it's also good to have a big challenge that says, okay, here's a fabric, go and see what you can do with that. Um, I started a, a group um, which originated from an exhibition where I entered this particular quilt that you're seeing now. Um, it, at the church that I belong to. Um, and the group evolved from congregants of the church. And eventually it included a number of foreign women who I became friends with. Some were from Australia, Indonesia, Brazil, Malawi, Turkey. Their husbands were in the country on short-term contracts. And so obviously, they were somewhat lonely and I managed to befriend them and um, we just had such a wonderful time together. The group, um, our group, the, 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 the St. Saviour's Quilting Group, which eventually became the Flame Lily Quilt Group, um, served not only as a source of information for local knowledge for these foreign women, but we also learned a lot from them. Um, they enriched our lives with various goodies that they cooked up and then taught us how to cook those things. And we just had a wonderful time of fellowship together. Um, all of them have returned to their countries of origin, but we still um, are in contact with, with each other. And so through, through WhatsApp and through Facebook, we always having some kind of chat. Um, and during um, this year, COVID 2021, we formed an international WhatsApp group and worked on a mystery quilt challenge that was put out by the Good Hope Quilters Guild. So we met once a week on Zoom, um, worked out any kind of problems that we might have had with um, that week's issue um, instructions, and um, we finished this quilt, which was um, Cape Fainbos. And Fainbos is the local flowers, which like Marsha mentioned, the proteas and other um, groupings of, of little bushes, which kind of look like they are absolutely nothing, but they we have the biggest grouping in the world of Fainbos in Cape Town. So um, it was a wonderful tribute to, to, um, to the Fainbos and it was so enjoyable to be able to talk to, we were mostly women from Turkey and women from, Ca and myself from Cape Town and women from Australia. So um, after we finished that, we decided to continue on um, and we worked on a um, sweatshirt jacket. So that's a, jack a sweatshirt that we chop up and then put um, patchwork pieces onto there in a design. So, and we continue to talk to each other, although we're not doing a project at the moment. Um, we Let's speak see. about, yeah. Let's Felicity, did you want me to go to the next slide? Is that the Australian one? Um, that is a no. I, I, well, I, if you want me to talk about this particular one hmm. yeah, yeah. later, then I, then we can do that. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned Australia, and I just wondered if that was my Oh, key. okay, okay. No, no, I got a specific thing about Australia when we get to that one. Okay. <laughs> Good. So, Dory... Um, uh, Sorry, I just lost my space here. Um, okay, 
let's go. Okay. Then, right. Then I worked um, with um, a Ruth Prass School of Art. And this is a small uh, school um, near, close to Cape Town. And um, the coordinator had called me up to consult on a quilt that the group was putting together for a competition. It was rewarding that they had won a ribbon once they had entered the, 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 the quilt. And of course, I was very happy when they accepted my offer to buy the quilt. So I own this beautiful quilt that they won um, a, 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 a ribbon for. Um, I stayed on for a couple of years and assisted them with several other commissions to raise funds for the group. The last one I worked on with the group was um, a friend of mine from Trinidad wanted a heritage quilt for her mother-in-law and their family was all over the, lived all over the world and this was a special birthday for the grandmother in Canada. So we had um, photos sent in and we put um, that onto fabric and then we used, as Marsha mentioned, the shwe shwe. So we, we boarded it with shwe shwe and um, the grandmother was absolutely thrilled. She said this was the best birthday present she had ever received in her life. So um, we, were, we were very excited about that, yeah. Then um, I, do, I did a, a, a group out in a place called Seerbrak, is a little impoverished village about two hours away from where I live. Um, and with the help of the quilters from the Flame Lily group, my group, uh, we'd go out there once a month and do a full day workshop. We'd stay over and on the Sunday, we'd um, spend a large part of the time in a more relaxed way with a coordinator to help her plan her month ahead. Um, we helped them put on an exhibition um, and also helped them put together a Saturday market and a Christmas market. And then there was a, a, a little town close by who was willing to take on their, um, their quilts and whatever else they were making to sell it for them. And the Rotary group had asked them to make bags for a convention. So it was a really a useful way of helping these women um, get an income. Um, I think they were extremely challenged and the community, the children were challenged. Um, they eventually put a grouping of school children um, in doing various kinds of projects. And during COVID, they made activity bags um, at which they distributed to the, to the children when, um, when the schools were closed because of the, the lockdown we had. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so to round up on, on, on the groups, it was important for me to pass the baton and encourage independence. I always believe in encouraging independence and have the people take on the role of leadership themselves. Um, and so, but I still stay in contact with them and I do send them donations when I can. Um, yeah, so, and my activism during my quilting years is all related to empowering um, the quilt groups, the women in the quilt groups economically and also helping them to build self-esteem. So yeah, um, I can go ahead and talk about the, the my quilt, that first African-American quilt. I, that is one of my favorites. Um, it was, I did it at a workshop. I have lovely, lovely teacher, Mary Ann Ciccone, mm. absolutely generous. She did a lot of quilts for people and she ha even made, it was, rather amusing for me because she made some quilts here for to send back to America and I just you know it never made sense to me but okay maybe our, our fabric was a little bit different so um 
I, I loved what I really love about this method is that it, as she told me, it originated with the slaves down in the south and people weren't allowed to have sharp implements. So they had to tear a fabric and they would pick up the slivers of fabric when they worked in the big plantation houses. Um, and uh, so, so this really, really fascinated me. And it was a real challenge putting those tiny little bits together and then trying to make sense and get it linear so that you could see um, pieces uh, uh, effectively. Yeah. So thanks. That that that's that's my African American quilt. You're on mute. Do you want to go? Okay. And that so now, that's right. So now, yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's my Australian block exchange. One of the women who had returned to Australia and joined the group there had asked that we, um, whether our group would be willing to do a block exchange. So for a year, um, each month we made blocks, African blocks that we sent over there and they sent us Australian blocks. And then after the year, we put together um, 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 a quilt uh, for each of us. Um, we landed up um, with, having to display our stuff at the group. Um, and the, the, the coordinator of the group actually came to visit us at some point in time. So it was all really exciting and um, enjoyable, really enjoyable. Um, for me, it was particularly enjoyable because it brought back my time that I lived in Australia and, and I'm very, very fond of Australia. So um, it was extremely heartwarming for me to do that. Yeah. We'll go on to the next one because we want to leave some time at the end for questions. Okay. So that's my Wabi Sabi um, quilt. And so just before uh, the COVID lockdown, we did this piece. And the philosophy of Wabi Sabi employs the ancient art of repairing something that is broken with gold without concealing the fracture. And according to the Spanish psychologist Tom, Tomas Navarro, the lessons we learn in adversity are the gold that binds the broken shards together. I think at this stage in the pandemic, all of us have had bits of us broken up. So I think um, it's a time that we can put our lives together or our bits together with that gold scene. Yeah. So uh, calm in the corona chaos came about um, when the guild put out a, um, a challenge of a mystery quilt at the beginning of 2020. And this was before we even knew Corona was gonna be around. Um, I generally don't like to do mystery quilts because I want to know what I'm going to see at the end of the quilt. Um, anyway, I decided I was going to do this because it was, it was a challenge. It was, I hadn't done it before. So I got stuck into it. And as I progressed, I was not really, I was becoming more and more disenchanted as, it, as the time went on. And by the time it came out, by the time we had hit six months, I just had had enough of what I was seeing. I hated the quilt. I thought it was terrible. I thought, I don't know where I'm going to put it. I didn't know who I could give it to. And so I left it off a while. Then when I went back to it, um, I started to tweak it and I changed the colors here and there. And then when I came to see the border, I really liked the border and I changed the colors to a large degree there. And so um, having initially thought that this was Corona chaos, I believe, you know, when I hated it, it was Corona chaos for me. And then as I moved through working with it again and then having it go, to 
um, the long arm quilter, who's my friend and just absolutely brilliant, turns things into magic. It came back and I loved it. And so I called it my calm in the Corona chaos. Yes. A good story. So this is um, a, a, a significant political piece for me. Um, and it was designed and inspired by the sad event of the murder of George Floyd. Um, a vigil was organized by my friend and priest at the Good, Good Shepherd Anglican Church in Kirstenbosch, um, Joe Tyers. Um, and at the time of the funeral, we observed an hour of silence with the placards you can see. And the last eight minutes, I knelt because the other two ladies couldn't kneel. So I ran into the church, got a cushion, got two cushions, and knelt for the last eight minutes. Um, it was a very emotionally moving um, um, uh, 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 vigil for me. And I didn't expect to have the reaction, the emotional reaction that I did have. It brought up a lot of memories of my political activism, both here and in Australia. Um, and it also reminded me how much work there is still to be done to stop oppression worldwide. Um, the photograph you see um, is me on the extreme left and then my friend and priest Joe Tyers in the middle. And then that's that's Reverend Joe Tyers. She she she's she's very modern, and so you know I I really think of her as Reverend Joe Tyers, but of, obviously that's her title. And then um, the Reverend Nabuntu Magenza on the extreme right. Um, and the photograph was taken by Michelle Tyers. So um, I really. Um, enjoy, enjoy doing the the quilt, and I think it was a little bit of a appeasement to 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 my pain around what happened to George Floyd. Yeah. Well, thank you, Felicity. Um, I was going to interject with some questions, but I actually think that you answered along the way some of the things I was going to ask about. But maybe now, Brenna, we could turn it to some of the questions and um, that people have been posing. And um, yes, thanks. And Absolutely. I'll, should I leave this image up or, or go to it? Uh, Whatever your preference. I'd like to leave it up. It's very powerful. I agree. I think it's phenomenal. Let's see. Um, let's start with, um, can you tell us what type, what fiber type a shui shui cloth is made out of? Oh, I'm going to defer to Felicity. <laughs> Although I will, I will say, um, like the definitive book uh, was published, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago. I forget with this pandemic time clock now. Um, yeah, uh, Juliette Lieb Dutois um, in in South Africa. So uh, this is this is everything you would ever want to know about Sheshwe. But in a short form, um, the textile artist <laughs> who uses it. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... Shui Shui is, first of all, 100% cotton. All, okay. all the Shui Shui is 100% cotton. But it has a heavy component of wax on it. So the printing is done with a wax component. And so it's got a very distinctive smell. And we have a tendency <laughs> to, when we go into the shops and 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 go to the shui shui bolts. We kind of stand there a bit like addicts breathing <laughs> in the, the waxy smell. Um, but also where before you use it, you always have to wash it several times. Hot water in order to get the wax out. Um, and then oftentimes 
there's quite a lot of um, uh, dye that will wash off. Yeah. Now, do you find, um, I'm wondering if it's, it's at all similar to like a batik fabric. Um, I know I've had experience like dyeing my own batiks and there's a lot of like ironing with the newsprint to try to get some of that excess wax off. Do you find that you have to do that with this fabric as well? Or do you just do a, a good couple of washes and it usually is resolved that way? I do a good couple of very hot washes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and maybe, um, you know, I, we could also share that uh, traditionally there were more blue and white colors and brown, brown and white colors, but today you can get them like in hot pink and orange, right? Correct. The original, the original blues um, and Joe, Joe Tyers, um, alongside her, her priesthood, she ran a um, company that used shui shui all the time. So, and even today, her family has got um, a vestment, a, 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 a factory that makes and sells priest vestments. And they, she uses an enormous amount of shui shui. You can, um, you can Google it and uh, have a look at it, African mm -hmm. praise. Um, uh, uh, and it's very interesting to see how they use the shui shui products in there. But uh, uh, Marsh is correct. We now have an enormous range of colors. In fact, Joe, Joe was just telling me one of the priests had requested um, a, a, a piece and he wanted in what they called um, the four seasons. I'm not too sure what that means, but it's a full range of colors through, I would imagine, the seasons. And so she was saying, we're going tomorrow to get the colors so that she can make this piece. So yeah, um, you know, we just have every color uh, of wow. the rainbow. Yeah. Wow, moment. that's amazing. Do you have any, um, do you have any information about where the Shui Shui first started being made? Um, was there an area of South Africa that it was really first started mm -hmm. getting made um, before, because it, it seems like it's grown to be quite inclusive as the color range. Um, it seems like it's much more pervasive now, but do you have any background on where it started? So I don't have much background, but from what I learned from Jo, since she's been involved in it for so long, is that um, the grouping called Three Cats, I'm not sure if that that um, label showed up when Marsha showed. Uh, but I can, uh, I can show a picture of it, hold it up. Yeah. In, but and, go ahead. That is, is London. Is, is mm -hmm. London? Yeah. Um, and I th the, the, the original family was used that um, label and mm -hmm. then they evolved and have now gone into two, two companies. So each one's running their own um, products. Um, but originally it was, yeah. I think you can see the uh, three cat label right there. Oh, yeah. yep. And it's, it's interesting, before you said three cats, somebody in the chat typed in to say that three cats was the best quality you can yes. get. So <laughs> other people are on it. That's a fantastic. Correct. And Marsha, do you mind sharing the title of the book that you held up oh, sure. and the, the sure. title and author one more time? Yeah. Um, there's the title. And the author is Juliet Lee Dutois. Perfect. And it was published by University of KwaZulu Natal Press. Perfect. Now, um, so since we've just been talking about three cats a little bit, um, do you know if they make any other cloths or is Shui Shui kind of their bread and butter, what they only make? My understanding that it's, that is what they do. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. And, I, and I will, you know, I'm touting her book, but it's got marvelous historical photographs in it and contemporary photographs. So it gives you really fabulous feel of how it has been embedded into South African sort of aesthetic um, sense. That sounds I, amazing. I see we just had somebody say um, 
the Gama Textiles, which is which yeah. is the, the the company. Yeah. Wow. Um. So I'm wondering if we could pull the Wabi Sabi quilt back up and have Felicity talk just a little bit more about that. Sure. Just a moment. The Wabi Sabi. I think that was a fan favorite. What is the size of this one, Felicity? Oh, that's quite small. It's about, um, I think, 0.7, the 75 centimeters square. Very small. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. small. And um, yeah, so um, do you want me to go over the same uh, Brenna, that I went no, over. not necessarily um, the same. I, we just had a question to ask you to talk about a little bit more about it. I think that okay. um, it's a lovely story you shared. So if there's any other stories with it, if not, we can also move on to another question. Right. Um, no, well, it, maybe I can tell you, if you see the yellow, that bright yellow that's jumping out, mm -hmm. that is actually um, uh, 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 offcuts that we had from um, they do a drive to raise funds for what was it? Um, a, a bone marrow donors. Mm -hmm. And so one of our um, supermarket chains uh, once a year runs a campaign um to to raise funds selling bandanas in various colors so they got these beautiful bright colors they have yellow the purple pink blue green um and that is exceptionally and it's it's the sunflower fund so you can see little sunflowers on there and so every year they have a different design but they continue to use the sunflowers so that 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 is quite a significant piece to have in there because of um, the, the the harrowing disease of, of bone marrow. You know, it's um, it's really really quite a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, one of, one of the questions I did not ask, but um, is, is I, I, if you could talk a little bit about your studio because I think every one of us loves to see where do they work. Where does the artist work? What does that space look like? And you were going to be doing your your um, this Zoom meeting from your studio, but the, the internet was not cooperating. But could you just give us a little description because it's in another whole building on your property. Ah, you talking about the teaching studio, Marcia? Yes. 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 So, so, so I'm fortunate enough to have a studio, well-equipped studio, which is in my house, which is where I would have had the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Zoom meeting from. Um, but I have a quilting teaching studio, which is on the property. And that is where I work with my group. And um, we just have a, an exceptional view from this. So it's very inspiring. Um, it's like the mountains. They look at the mountains. They look at the mountains. They do, and also they look at my chickens and my ducks. <laughs> in, and so, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I like the teaching studio, but I do prefer my own studio, which um, it has got everything everywhere and quilts on the walls to inspire me. Um, Wabi Sabi is sitting right there, directly opposite me when I sew. So it's a great inspiration for me. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a, a well-equipped studio. And um, I'm fortunate to work with the women in my group who are just, I feel, incredibly inspiring. Yeah. Thanks. Is there any other question, Brenna, there? Yeah, so um, I, we only were a little bit over on time, but I really want to mm. ask this one final question. Um, can you share any similarities or differences? Um, mostly we talked about the Dutch tradition, you know, the um, Dutch coming over in the 1600s, as you said in the beginning, Marsha. Um, so do you see a lot of Dutch influences in the current fabric? 
Are you asking me? I, I, um, either to one both, of us. To both of you, to either. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any sort of similarity or difference. Like clearly that was hundreds of years ago, but there is still an impact because there's always an impact um, with those kinds of things, maybe, with colonization. Maybe the wax print fabrics, you know, that were so traded by or sometimes produced by Dutch. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I think the, the influence is really more um, <laughs> Sheshwe. Uh, if you had to choose one fabric to say, well, that's a South African quilt, uh, right? Felicity, mm -hmm. not even that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, and do you, um, do you feel like the, like the um, techniques, like they brought a lot of the techniques with them to create the Shui Shui fa fabric? Or is it like the colors or the motifs? Like what, um, how exactly do you see that influence? It, it replicates some of the already existing trade okay. uh, cloth. But um, yeah, it, it, I think it's just, if you look closely at the patterns and yeah, it, like um, Felicity said, you can go online and you know, there are Pinterest pages mm -hmm. full of Sheshwe. You can see that incorporated into some of the designs most of them are fairly graphic or a little mm -hmm. bit of florals, but you can see like maybe the um, the hats from Lesotho, um, you know, or or drums or other okay. imagery right. that is very African mm -hmm. incorporated yeah. into these these textiles. Yeah, the new the new prints that have come out now are uh, have got a real um, modern element to them. I feel. A um, lot of geometrics, a mm -hmm. lot of um, circles, um, yeah. And and while it has got those traditional pieces that 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 Marcia spoke about, mm -hmm. we are seeing a very interesting new fusion happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Well, I want to thank you both so much for being with us today. Um, this was such an incredible talk. I really appreciate you both being here. And I want to thank everybody who joined us for being here with us today and learning something new, hopefully. And one last time, we cannot do textile talks without the help of our sponsors. So I want to list those off one more time before we leave for the day. Um, textile talks are sponsored by Moda Fabrics and Supplies, Quilting Daily, eQuilter.com, Orophil, Artistic Artifacts, Clover, Empty Spools Seminars, Misty Fuse, Nine Patch Fabrics, Quilt Mania, Schiffer Publishing, TheQuiltShow.com, and Thai Silks. So again, Felicity and Marsha, thank you so much for being with us. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.